Let's read our call to worship responsively from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, you are very great. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we bless your holy name this day, for you are good. Your mercies are everlasting and your truth endures to all generations. We bless you, Jesus, God the Son, for you willingly came to the earth for our sake, died an atoning death, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And we bless you, Father and Son, that you send your Holy Spirit to be in us and among us, to enable us to worship you. You give us the fruit of the Spirit, and Spirit, you give us gifts. How we praise you, triune God, for you are indeed marvelous. And we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand please and let's sing our opening hymn of praise, number 302, Rejoice the Lord is King. the Lord is Be seated. One of my heroes of the faith is a man named Ambrose, who was the Bishop of Milan back in the fourth century. God used him to bring to faith another great, great man of the faith, Augustine, later the Bishop of Hippo. Ambrose was a man who knew the truth, who loved the truth, and who taught the truth. And our prayer of confession this morning comes from him. Let's pray together. O Lord, you who are merciful, 
Take away my sins from me and kindle within me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away this heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh, a heart to love and adore you, a heart which delights in you, loves you, and pleases you. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's continue to confess our individual sins silently and privately. Let us pray. Amen. I'll say it later on in my sermon, a quote from Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. He took away the power of sin. And though we still sin, He forgives us eagerly and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I declare to you, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of assurance, number 304, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's stand. Please be seated. Most of you, I believe, received midweek prayer concerns from Mandy. Uh, there were many of them, but I want to highlight uh, a couple of those and then add a new one. We found out this morning that uh, Jim Kohler was taken to South Lake Hospital on Friday. Uh, they're still trying to determine the problem, but if you could remember him in the silent time of prayer, uh, that would be great. Also, 
as you may have noticed in the uh, email, Jack Williams is in very, very critical condition. He has been a wonderful and faithful member of this church for a long time. Uh, also pray for Pastor John's brother Jim up in Nova Scotia who is also in very critical condition. So let's go to the Lord together in prayer, prayers of thanksgiving and then prayers of petition. Our Father and our God, we thank you this morning that we're here, that you have been gracious enough to enable us to be here in a time where uh, much of our nation, much of our world uh, is really in a uh, place we've never been before. We pray, Lord, for those who are suffering from COVID-19. We pray for those who have lost loved ones due to this virus. Lord, we are thankful that even in really difficult times, you are present. We can turn to you. You've said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we can receive comfort even in the midst of loss. Father, we do pray for our nation and our world that this vaccine would be effective that it would be distributed effectively. Lord, help our government officials to be diligent in seeking to get the available vaccine out as quickly as possible. And thank you for the companies that have made it. Lord, we do look forward to a time where uh, there will be herd immunity and we will no longer have to worry Father, we thank you for the gift of family. We thank you for the family of God represented by the church. And that you have placed us here in part to strengthen one another's hand in you, to encourage each other in our relationship with you. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be people who come alongside one another and pray and encourage and love. Now, Father, we take a time in silence where we lift up particular individuals who need our prayers. Let us pray to the Lord, and Lord, hear our silent prayers now, we ask in Jesus' name. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who hears and answers prayers, and we make our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen.
good and perfect gift comes from you, the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow due to change. We praise you, Lord, that you are a giver, that you are unchanging, that you are perfect love, and that you have poured out your love upon us in Jesus Christ and given us blessing upon blessing. Thank you for the chance to give back some of that to you, Lord, for the sake of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We're continuing our two-month series on the Apostles' Creed, and so guess what? Our confession of faith is the Apostles' Creed. Let's read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning our Old, Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 110, verses 1 through 7. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is the word of the Lord. I've asked this question a number of times in a number of different settings, and no one has answered it correctly. We'll see if somebody can this morning. Here's the question. What Old Testament verse is most frequently quoted in the New Testament? Anybody know? All right, my streak continues. I've had people say, well, is it maybe Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? And the answer to that is, no, that's never quoted in the New Testament. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, what about in the beginning God created? No. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now the answer is what Judy just read. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That verse is quoted seven times in the New Testament. Jesus quotes it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then it's quoted twice in Acts, twice in Hebrews. And it's referred to four other times. It's not quoted directly, but referred to four other times. Why? Why? Well, hopefully you'll be able to answer that question by the end of this message. It's called... Jesus' unanswerable question because he asked it of his religious opponents, the Pharisees. He said, now if the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of David, why does David call him Lord? Because David wrote that Psalm 110. Everybody agrees with that. It was written 1,000 years before Jesus was born. Why does David if he's the son of David, why does he call him Lord? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
Well, in order for the Pharisees to answer that question, they would have to admit two things. One, that the Messiah, the Christ, is God. Because the Old Testament refers to him as God. Yahweh, God the Father, says to Adonai, the Lord, God the Son, sit at my right hand. They'd have to admit the Messiah is God. And secondly, they would have to admit that the Messiah was pre-existent. He existed before David, which is, of course, true of Jesus. This prophecy is a prophecy of Christ's ascension. You see, it's a, it's a golden thread which cannot be separated. Christ's atoning death, his bodily resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. Now, there are a lot of people who died on the cross. Not just the two thieves with Jesus, but hundreds and hundreds. The Romans loved to crucify their enemies. But only one died for our sins. Why? Because he's God. There are, in fact, a number of people who died and came back to life. If you read the New Testament, you're aware. The most famous, of course, is Jesus' friend Lazarus. But there was the widow of Nain's son. There was Jairus' daughter. Paul brings somebody back from the dead who fell asleep during a boring sermon. <laughs> By the way, that happened. No. So... A lot of people came back to life who were dead, but we don't call that a resurrection. We call that technically a, a resuscitation. Why? Because they died again. Jesus didn't. He resurrected and he ascended to heaven. There are two other people who ascended to heaven. Do you know who they are? Enoch, back in the book of Genesis, and Elijah, chariots of fire. We just saw the movie. However, Enoch and Elijah did not ascend as Jesus did because Jesus had something they didn't. The technical term in Latin is Christ's session. The Latin word session means to sit. That's what your elders do. They sit around <laughs> over in that room once a month. And they, they literally are to sit in judgment as Jesus does. They're to judge the spiritual welfare of this congregation. Jesus' session is that he resumes his rightful place of authority as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the place of authority, the right hand of the Father. The ascension of Jesus Christ is tremendously important. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 about the result of that ascension. This is verses 7 to 16. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. We call that the incarnation. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves 
and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when every part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. The big idea, my message is very simple this morning, and it's this. When Christ ascended to heaven, he poured out his gifts upon us. Now the greatest gift that Jesus gave, which he said to his disciples, it's good that I go. Can you imagine that? You lived with Jesus Every day for three years, you saw the incredible things he'd done. And then Jesus says to you, guess what? It's it's good that I'm leaving you. What? Yeah, because when I go, I will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit. Our Westminster Confession says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father and from the Son. And that's all I'm going to say about the great, greatest of all gifts, the Holy Spirit, because we're talking about that next week. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Let's move on to another gift, and that is the gifts of the Spirit. We see them in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes that Christ, when he ascended, gave Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, that's really one phrase, shepherd teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. These are what we call the foundational gifts. Those are the first gifts that God gave to the church. The apostles, the disciples, word meaning learner, became apostles, those who are sent out. And they were sent out to proclaim the message. Along with them were prophets. The word prophet means to speak forth the truth. Paul was an apostle and a prophet. There were a number of prophets in the New Testament. And then evangelists. That word means those who proclaim good news. And then pastor teachers. That's what I am, a pastor teacher. My job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to help you grow in your faith so that you can use your gifts. Now, interestingly, there are four places in the New Testament where a list of spiritual gifts are given. This is one. There's another one in Romans 12. And the gifts that Paul mentions there are very different. He talks about the gift of administration. Mandy Clee. He talks about the gift of service, which is many of you, and the gift of encouragement, the gift of giving, a lot of different gifts. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives another list of gifts, speaking gifts. And in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he talks about the gift of prophecy and the gift of speaking and the gift of hospitality. There are 19 spiritual gifts mentioned in the New Testament. But I don't believe they're meant to be exhaustive. These aren't all the gifts because each gift is, each list is different. And the New Testament doesn't mention gifts that are in the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks about the gift of artistic and manual craftsmanship in the temple. The gift of music that David had. He could soothe Paul's fevered spirit with his music. Those are all gifts from the Lord. Now, I want to say three things about spiritual gifts. First of all, it is very important if you're a Christian to know what your spiritual gifts are. And if you don't know, please see Mandy. She has a 
inventory that can help you discover your spiritual gifts. First of all, you need to know them. Secondly, you need to realize the purpose of spiritual gifts. It's not to make us feel good about ourselves. It's to build up the church, to reach out in Christ's name into the community. <clears throat> Each one of us has different gifts. And the picture that Paul gives is like a human body. The different parts of our body all work together. We're the body of Christ. Unity in diversity. And finally, the message of the New Testament is having gifts that differ, let us use them. Bud Wilkinson, who was a great football coach at Oklahoma University, was a Christian, and he said, most churches are like football games. A football game is where you have 50,000 people who desperately need exercise watching 22 people who desperately need rest. <laughs> and often the church is like that. There are a few people who are working hard and a whole bunch of people who are spectators. That is not God's plan for his church. It's for all of us to use our gifts. Now, the Apostles' Creed tells us another gift that we don't often think of as a gift, but it's the gift of righteous judgment. Jesus actually tells people, judge with righteous judgment. Don't judge as a hypocrite, pointing out to other people faults in yourself, but judge righteously. If you were to ask any 10 people, man on the street, woman on the street, when we die, who judges us? Well, I believe a couple of people would say nobody. I don't believe in that whole idea of judgment. Our society is very becoming more and more secular. And so people don't believe in judgment because they don't want to believe in judgment. But those who do, there'd be a couple other responses. St. Peter, right? Because they've heard all the jokes. When you die, you appear before St. Peter. And then some would say, well, God, God the Father judges us. Ding, 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 you're all wrong. John 5.22 makes it very clear. I'll quote Jesus. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. And that's why the confession says he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. He judges the dead, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when he returns, he'll judge those who are still living. Jesus is the judge, and the book of Hebrews tells us why. He is our judge because he experienced everything that we experience. He's been tested and tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Nobody can stand before the judgment seat of Jesus and say, you know what, you don't understand. You never experienced what I did. Yeah, he did, and more. Another truth about judgment that is probably not popular in our culture is found in Hebrews 9.27, when the writer of Hebrews says, it is appointed for a man once to die, and then the judgment. I read recently that the Pew Research Foundation, which is one of the most respected research organizations in America, test, excuse me, <clears throat> interviewed people and came up with this statistic. One in three Americans believes in reincarnation. 
And this study said the majority of those people are not Hindus or Buddhists. But one in three Americans believes in reincarnation. We have a relative who believes in reincarnation. And he told me once that he thinks he's going to return as a fat person. Why? Because he judges fat people. What a sorry philosophy of life. <laughs> this endless cycle of reincarnation and rebirth. It's good news that we are appointed once to die and then the judgment. There are no second chances. We either accept Jesus Christ in this life as Lord and Savior or we don't and we are lost. The Bible tells us that Christians have nothing to fear, nothing to fear from judgment. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. I made a typo in your notes, by the way. It's 1 John 4, 17 and 18. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he, Jesus, is, so also are we in the world. We're his children. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. If we love Jesus Christ, if we've received him as our Savior from sin and the Lord of our lives, we have nothing whatsoever to fear in judgment. But that's not the end of the story. I do believe that the New Testament teaches that there is a second judgment. Christians pass through judgment. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I believe the New Testament teaches that there is a judgment of works. Jesus refers to it a number of times. He says, there will be a reward Every cup of cold water given in my name will not lose its reward. And listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. He's talking about he started the church and Apollos built upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, the day of judgment, will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though the, he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What Paul is saying there is that once you accept Christ, you have the foundation for living. And Jesus wants you to build on that foundation with things that last for all eternity. That's the image of gold, silver, and precious stones. Not those things that are burned up, wood, hay, and straw. I read a book by John Piper, Don't Waste Your Life. John Piper came down to Florida to visit a parishioner who had retired here. And this parishioner tried to impress Dr. Piper with his shell collection. She said, every morning I go out on the beach and I spend hours looking for new shells. And look at this collection of shells. Shells, excuse me. And uh, John Piper said, so when you die and you stand before the Lord, you're going to say, Lord, look at my wonderful seashell collection." He really wasn't involved in his church. He really wasn't doing much to share his faith. That is wood, hay, and straw. Um, we all need to look at our lives. Yes, God wants us to enjoy fun stuff, playing golf, watching TV, watching movies, whatever. 
But the real focus of our life needs to be those things that matter. Prayer, fellowship, sharing our faith, worship. We will experience a judgment of what we did with the gifts that God has given us. So here's the final question. How are you doing? How are you doing with the unique gifts God has entrusted to you? Let's pray. Lord, your parable tells us that each of us has been given talents. And we can either use them to multiply your influence in the world or we can bury them. Lord, may we be people who know our gifts. Use them to build up your church, to bless others. Until we come to maturity in our faith, let us speak the truth in love with one another and grow up into every way into Christ who is our head. We praise you, ascended Jesus. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn together. We stand. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.